When you think about being a disciple of someone, what do you think about? For some of you, this is a, a very foreign word. You don't really use this word outside of church culture, outside of church context very often. For some of you, maybe you come in here tonight, and uh, when, when you hear the word disciple, you think about the disciples that were in the Bible. Maybe you try to picture what they look like. They have long beards. Do they have staffs? Do they have whatever the equivalent to Birkenstocks was? Is that, is that what they wore like back in their day? And so often when I think about disciples, I think about what they look like. Tonight, I want, to think, I want us to think about what disciples do, their function. For the past few months, we've been in this series called Everyday Discipleship, and we've kind of been, it's been built around this whole idea of, of being a disciple of Jesus, of literally doing the same things that we see Jesus do. I was reminded of a sermon that Dave preached back in January, if you were here, just this incredible teaching. He's talking about Peter, and, and one night Peter and the other apostles were sitting in the boat, and they, and they see Jesus walking on the water. And because Peter wanted to be just like Jesus, he wanted to be his disciple. He wanted to do what Jesus did. He wanted to, to follow where he led. He, he looks at Jesus as he's walking the water. He says, Jesus, can I come too? Can I get out of the boat and walk on the water? And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, yes, come. And Peter gets out of the boat and he walks on the water because he got what it meant to be a disciple. Maybe we're not super familiar with the term disciple, but we are so familiar with the concept behind it. We see someone that we look up to, someone that we want to be like. We think that they have something worth offering, and so literally we, we, we start to do what they do. We do this in fashion. We do this in music. We do this with our professors. We do this with icons and with people that we meet who leave an impression on us. We see something in them, and we want to be just like them. So we dress like them. We sing like them. We talk like them. We do what they do. I was thinking about one of my mentors. I remember him telling me this several years ago. His name's Bill. And he said, yeah, he just kind of made this passing comment. He said, Brandon, I've been a follower of Jesus for 20-something years, and there have been three days where I haven't been in the scriptures. I'm like, what did you just say? Like, he said, yeah, there's only been three days the past 20-something years where I haven't been in the scriptures in some capacity. And I heard that. And you know, I'd gone weeks, maybe even months, without reading the scriptures up until this point. And, and, I, and I hear that, and I go, man, what is going on in his heart that... What kind of hunger does he have for God that, that over the past 20 years has been three days where he hasn't read? Or look at my friend Bill and I look at the way that, that he adores his wife, the way that he honors his wife when she is present and when she is not present, the way that he talks about how much he loves her and how crazy he is about her and it makes me feel uncomfortable how attractive to, to her that he still is and how he talks about that to me and, and, and it's just this, this situation where I see my friend Bill and I see the real love that he has for his wife or I think about the way that he cares about people who don't yet know Jesus. And I look at my friend and I go, I want to be like this guy. I want to do the things that he does. My chief aim this evening is to help us see Jesus. And that by seeing Jesus, we would, move, we would be moved to trust in Jesus. And that by trusting in Jesus, we would lay down our lives for him to truly become his disciples, to follow him, to do the things that he's doing. Acts chapter 5, let's go, let's look in verse 12, I want us to hear the story. It says, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. So we're the Lord from Acts chapter 5. I've been so excited to teach this text. God has just been stirring some things in me. Never taught this before. I want us to just kind of go through this verse by verse and, and, and look at the things that the Lord has for us. And so in verse 12, it says that, that the apostles, they performed many signs and wonders among the people. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly what the apostles were doing. 
But the word signs and wonders, they point to the marvelous, the mysterious, the supernatural works that were coming about through the hands of the apostles. Have you ever experienced something along these lines in your life? Have you ever witnessed firsthand or heard someone that you trust deeply? Share about something mysterious, share about something supernatural, above or outside or foreign to the natural world and order that we live in. Think about several years ago, hearing from our team that was in India. And Brooks was there, the guy was leading worship or playing drums tonight. And Dave was there and Jana was there, Savannah was there. And I remember them telling us about um, this day in India and, and they had just gotten done teaching and um, kind of all the, these kids, these people were, were gathered together in this little room and so uh, they were done for the day and so they dismissed uh, the, the children and, and it said that all the kids, they said all the kids left and they were outside playing, playing soccer, playing in the yard except for one little kid. And they noticed that this one little boy, they went over to him and they realized that he was paralyzed, that he was crippled, he couldn't walk. And I don't know what compelled them, I don't know what was going on in their minds or in their hearts, but um, a team of, from our church, like people who just sit among us on every Sunday, they, they walk over to this little boy and they, and they put their hands in this little boy and they pray the most unimpressive prayer ever. They just ask God to heal this little boy. And, and, and it was crazy because they, they told us, I've never seen anything like it. They said, literally, we saw the little boy's leg straighten out. And he stood up. And he took his steps for the first time in his life. And he wasn't just taking steps, but he started climbing and he was leaping and he was walking around. And, and they, said, uh, they said it was this unbelievable moment. And I'm with you. I, as the first time I was hearing this, I, I'm thinking all the things that you were thinking. Really? And then Dave shared something with me that I don't think I'll ever forget. He, he was talking to the pastor of the church there, and he says, man, this is incredible. I can't believe we just saw this. He said, have you ever seen anything like this before? And the pastor looked at Dave, and he says, God does this all the time. Think about this. Have you ever seen the, the supernatural work of God? The signs and wonders. And it's clear that in Acts chapter 5, something powerful, something real it's happening. Let's keep reading. Second part of verse 12, it says, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. So here's a picture that, that Christians are living in and around Jerusalem. They hadn't scattered and filled the earth yet. And so it seems from this text that they, they make a, a habit of gathering in this place called Solomon's Colonnade. And we're not exactly told what they do here. We learn from Acts chapter 3 that some preaching and teaching were done, and so we can infer that, that Solomon's Colonnade was this, this outdoor venue, and that people were coming together to, to hear about Jesus. Similarly to what we're doing tonight, we, we come together for Jesus, to be with Jesus, to worship Jesus, to hear about Jesus. In verse 13, it's, it's tricky. Did you hear those words? It says that no one else dared join the believers. Even though the, the believers were highly regarded by the people. And I was just wrestling with this this week, going, man, if, if the Christians were so highly regarded by those who don't believe in Jesus, why didn't those who, who, who didn't believe in Jesus, why didn't they join them? If there was such respect, if there was such, you know, exaltation of the Christians, if, if there was something about their, them that was so different, why didn't the people who were not believers, why did they not join them? And it made me wonder, you know, several of you, you identify in that place tonight. You're not a follower of Jesus. And, and just allow me to be the, someone to just to welcome you, to let you know that you're so, uh, you're so welcome and we're so glad that you're here tonight. But let me speak to those of you who are Christians for a minute. This verse, it made me wonder, do people who don't follow Jesus, do they highly regard us? I go, what was it about the love of these Christians, the lifestyle of these Christians, the realness of the believer's faith, that non-Christians looked at them and said, man, those Christians are different. 
They are good. They are special. Verse 14 says, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. What's happening here is that those who were not Christians, they weren't just hanging around Christians as they gathered to worship Jesus. But what we're seeing in Acts chapter 5 is that people who were not believers were becoming believers. People who had previously not believed that Jesus had died and rose again and come out of death to forgive all, to give us new life, were receiving this. People who had not faith in Jesus were stepping into this real faith that they went from not believing that Jesus was Lord to believing that he was in fact Lord of all. It says that women and men were discovering what life is like with Jesus. Verse 15 it says, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. So last verse, it says that crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. That last line has been bouncing back and forth in my mind and my heart all week. I'm going, what do we do with that? What do I do with that? Acts chapter 5, it says that all of them were healed. I want to be real careful here. I don't want to say something that the scriptures aren't saying. But it's pretty clear. It doesn't say that some were healed. It doesn't say that a few were healed. It doesn't say that one was, fe- was healed. It says that all of them were healed. And I don't exactly know how you hear that. I don't exactly know what you believe about this. But I know that there are many of you who are here tonight and you believe in the healing power of Jesus. And when you read verses like this or when you read stories about Jesus healing, if you're honest, if you're completely honest, you are so incredibly discouraged. Because as you look at your life, you believe in the healing power of Jesus. And yet the healing power of Jesus hasn't seemed to come in your life. And I know the way that our minds work so often when we pray, we do everything that we know how to do and nothing seems to change. We start to question, what's wrong with me? Do I not have enough faith? What's wrong with, what is wrong? Why is God healing in Acts chapter five, but he's not healing in 2016? Some of you are are wrestling with this, that, that, that because you're a believer, because you believe that the scriptures are authoritative and true, you read this and you believe that Jesus healed. You believe that in this moment that all people were healed, but you no longer believe that, that God operates in this way. And if this is where you find yourself tonight, I just want to say, man, I, I spent a lot of my life being there. I spent a lot of my life reading the Bible and being so impressed, so wowed with God, believing that that this was all about what God used to be like. And I want to speak into the different ways that we might be hearing and receiving this tonight. But in order for me to do that, we have to to come to the text and on equal playing ground, we have to to start at the same place. And and this is a place that we, we all have to start. That the scriptures, they, the, the stories, the things that we read about in scripture, they were, they were not given to, to deceive us or to control us or to suppress us or to tease us. The things that were given to us in scripture were given to teach us. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I believe in this case, what we're reading in Acts chapter 5, the reason that, that we're given this is to teach us about the power that God has. Not that he had, but that he still has. The word sick in verse 16 in the Greek, it literally means to be ill. It means to be weak. We use that word sick to cover a broad spectrum. We're sick when we have a fever and we're, we're sick when we have cancer. And the best I can tell, this is the same way that, that the word is being used here in Acts chapter 6, that the word sickness is, is used as a blanket term to refer to a multitude of things. 
This other piece in uh, verse 16, it says that, that many people who had impure spirits. We talked about this some as a church, but the reality is that, that we don't talk about this much in our church or in our culture, even in, our, in the United States. Because it's mysterious. Because this idea of, of impure spirits, things that are unseen, and we live in a rational society. But the truth is that there are beings that have been created that we cannot see that have become hostile and rebellious to God and hostile and rebellious to anyone who is allied with him. We read about this in Colossians chapter one where it says that all things have been made through Jesus and for Jesus. Things visible and invisible. And whether you receive this or not, whether you choose to accept this, and I would strongly encourage you to receive this, to start stepping in, to start believing this, that we live in a world that there are things going on in us and around us that we cannot see. They're so incredibly real. It says that there are many people all over Jerusalem that are being tormented by evil spirits. The word tormented means to be troubled, to be disturbed, to be harassed, to be annoyed continually or chronically. And I point this out not so that we become fearful or paranoid. I, I point these things out for two reasons. That many of us come here tonight, the first is this, many of us come here tonight and we are suffering from all kinds of sickness. All kinds of illness. That many of us come here tonight and we're being so tormented, so harassed, so troubled by the enemy. The enemy has so convinced us that there is no hope, there's no shaking, whatever it is that has gotten a hold of us. There is no such thing as, as, as us discovering a life of peace and joy. And the first reason I want to just talk about this tonight is just so that you and I will acknowledge the realness of the sickness and the impure spirits that, that are in our world. You do that, we do that awkward meet and greet that, that none of you like, but we keep doing it every week at the beginning of the five o'clock. And, and here's the truth. You, you might have got to know someone's name. You got to know a little bit about them. But, but here's the truth. You have no idea what's going on in the person beside you. There are people that are sitting right beside you that you have no idea the pain that they wake up with in the morning. The pain that they live with all day, the pain that they go to bed with at night, you have no idea the, the way that the enemy is harassing and lying. And I want us just to accept this. But the second reason I point this out is I want us to understand this, that Jesus Christ has authority on earth over everything. Ephesians chapter one, let me read this to us real fast. Says that power is the same that he as a mighty strength that God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Listen to this far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under Jesus' feet. Or think about what Jesus tells his disciples in, uh, in Matthew chapter 28. He'd just come out of death and he looks at his apostles and, and he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And what Jesus is helping us see, what he's helping us believe, what he's helping us step into is this reality that, that there's not a place that you and I will go on this earth. That Jesus is not the most powerful, most authoritative man there is. So you think about it in this way. If, if the president of the United States of America to work, were to walk in any room in America, he is automatically the most powerful person in the room. That he has authority, that what he says goes, and Jesus is helping us understand that we have nothing to be fearful of. That he is sovereign over all sickness, over all illness, over all impure spirits. And we're going to talk about healing in just a minute, but before I do, before we do that, I want to talk about Jesus. I go, what in the world is going on in Acts chapter 5? People were healing. People were bringing sick people out and laying them in the street so that shadows might fall on them. People from all over the towns of Jerusalem were, were coming and every single one of them were being healed. I'm going, what's going on here? 
And it seems that these men, these apostles, they wanted to be just like Jesus. You see, there was a deep love in, in their hearts for Jesus. And this is where it has to start for all of us. These 12 men, you see, they understood that although they had been unfaithful to Jesus, although they had been um, forgetful, although they had failed Jesus over and over again, in fact, just a few weeks earlier, they had abandoned Jesus, let him die on a cross all by himself. And when Jesus Christ, the triumphant one, when he came out of death and when he came and he found his apostles and he looked them in the eyes, he didn't beat them up and he didn't shame them and talk about how disappointed he was. He looked them in the eyes and he says, this was the reason that I died so that sinful, forgetful, backsliding, unfaithful people could be forgiven, could be included, could be included in my father's house. And when the apostles, when they looked in the eyes of Jesus and they realized how unfaithful how sinful they had been. But then when they looked in the eyes of Jesus, they saw mercy. They saw forgiveness. They saw love. And Jesus changed them. Jesus had so captured their heart that they spent the rest of their lives wanting to, to love him, giving their lives for him, wanting to be just like him. And so I'm wondering what's going on here. Part of it, they just had such a devotion to Jesus. The other part is I, I think they just, they, they really trusted in things that Jesus had told them. So in John chapter 14, just a few weeks earlier, Jesus looked at his disciples and he says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing and they will do even greater things than I'm doing. And it seems that the disciples were, were looking at their lives and they're going, man, we Jesus was, was going all around and he was telling people about the kingdom of God and that's exactly what we're doing. But as they looked at their life, they, they realized that, that the healing, that the power, that the things that Jesus was doing while he was with them on earth, they did not want Jesus to stop. And they were crazy enough to believe that God would use people like them to keep healing, to keep lifting his name. Andrew pointed this out to me earlier this week. I love the prayer that they prayed in Acts chapter four, verse 30. And I'm not, I'm not sure what compelled them to pray this prayer, but I love that they, they, they pray this. They say, God, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders to the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And I love what we see happening in Acts chapter five. that God allowed them to be the vessels through which his power and his healing came. Two things that I want us to think about tonight. I think God is wanting to know if we are a church that wants all of him, I think God is wanting to know if, if we are a church that wants all that he has to give to us. And it's a, it's a hard question. For many of us, we come in here and, and our walk with God, our connection with God is so good and is so sweet. And, and the thought of, of more, we're just like, God, I'm happy, I'm content. Have you ever had breakthrough in your, in your walk with God? Have you ever been experiencing God and then, and then something happened that, that just opened your eyes and your heart, that, that opened your belief to this whole new world with, with God that you didn't even know existed? And the reality is that, that when, when, when God shows us things that we didn't even know exist, when we choose to, to step into those places, those spaces with God, there is a joy. There is a meaning that comes to our life that, that, that we start to, to, to realize that this life, God, is so much more than, than meant just to be enduring. 
That when we realize that, that God has more of his spirit, more of his goodness, more of his gifts, more of his power, more of his realness for us, when, 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 when we open our hands and we say, God, we don't know what this looks like. But God, we want to be a church that wants all that you have to give us. Do you want to be a part of a church that says, God, whatever you want to give us, we want that. Are we willing to believe? Are we willing to ask for God to move today, tonight, the same way they did in Acts chapter four and five? The second thing I want us to think about in my personal kind of prayer time, as I've been reading, as I've been pressing into the Lord, there is something about the public, the going to Jesus in front of others that I just can't seem to get out of my head. Here in Acts chapter five, people came to the most public place and they sat in the street because they were expecting and hoping to be healed. And we read verse 15 and, and we go, oh, that's cool. What a, what a neat little story. And, and we don't let that, the, the realness of what was happening soak into our hearts that there were these people who were sick and they were, they were living in, in their homes or they were living in apartments, where, wherever it is that they were living. And instead of just sitting in, on their couch or sitting in their living room asking God to heal them, they, they, they understood that there was something about faith that requires taking a step. And so they go and they're laying in the streets. They've taken a step because they really believe that Jesus is still healer. And it's undeniable as you read about the life of Jesus that over and over again, people came to him. People ask in front of other people in public places, Jesus, heal me. And I just get this sense I could be wrong here. I'm, I'm not perfect. There's, I'm on the same playing field as you, that if you're a Christian, we have the same Holy Spirit, that there's, like, I don't have this special access to God. But God has entrusted me to be one of the leaders and the cares of, of you, of this church. And I sense that God is inviting us to be a church that walks by faith, to be a church that asks and expects God to move and to heal through his son, Jesus Christ, today. I get this sense that we're, that we're not supposed to hedge our bets any longer. We're not supposed to play it safe. We're not supposed to be fearful anymore that, that God isn't going to heal us, but that he's inviting us to let people into our real lives into our real struggles, into our real illnesses, into our real being tormented by impure spirits and to ask and to expect in public places in front of other people for Jesus to heal. Now I welcome any feedback. If I'm being heretical in this, I, I, I ask you to come and, and approach me after the, we get done to, tonight and I will, I will hear you and listen to you, I promise you. I'm not trying to be heretical, but I want us to think about this. So Matthew chapter six, Jesus looks at his disciples, he looks at his people and he says, when you pray, I want you to go into your house, I want you to go in the closet, I want you to shut the door. And, and when you pray, your father will meet you there. You'll be rewarded. And as Christians, we, we've got this down. That we are so good, we're so diligent about the private places with God, about getting on our knees where no one else sees us and calling out to God. And, and, I, and I think we need to keep doing that. That there's more of, of that, that, that God has for us, that, that there's more of us when we go home tonight, more of us on our knees interceding. But I also know that in Matthew chapter six, Jesus is, seems to be speaking to a group of people, speaking to a crowd that seem to be drawing attention to themselves. 
specifically in the way that they're praying. And so they're, they're, they're getting up in front of people and they're making these lengthy prayers and they're using these impressive words. And it's not about the connection with God. It's all about people thinking they're spiritual, people thinking that, that there's something different about them. And so Jesus, I think, speaks this private prayer to, to, to humble us and to show us that it's not about what other people think. But, but, but so often, the reason I'm even talking about Matthew chapter 6, I think it is relevant for our conversation tonight. So often, we are so fearful about coming into public places in front of other people and asking God to heal. And I sense that he's inviting us to be a, a people that walk by faith when it comes to his ability to heal. My friends, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing that Jesus is going to heal you. This is not me standing up here saying, do this and you will be healed, guaranteed, 100% of the time. For we see many instances where healing doesn't come. We see this with Timothy, we see this with Paul. My hope for us tonight, the, the, the anthem that I think God has been given to me tonight is, is that we would get past our fears that we would see Jesus for who he is. I love, the book, I love what the book of Hebrews says. It says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. That you and I, we would, we would understand that, that Jesus is the one who came to die for us. To save us, to include us. That the same Jesus who worked through some people who simply asked and believed that he would move and heal. The same Jesus today. I want us to believe that Jesus is healer. I want us to believe that, that Jesus is healer. I want us to believe that Jesus is healer. I want us to believe that, that Jesus is healer. For our actions to prove that. And here's the reality. God might not heal. I think about my friend earlier this week. Our staff got together and we were praying. And, and one of my friends, he, my best friends in the whole world, he's had back problems since he was a young teenager. French 29, 30 years old now. And he looks at us and he says, I believe that God is healer, but God hasn't healed my back. He says that, that, that God, he said, but, but, but God has my heart. And that's not a cop out. That's not some cheap answer that my friend gives you that, that, that he's been walking in this suffering, this pain for 15 years. And for 15 years, he has not quit believing in Jesus who heals. Think about my friend who's been struggling with anxiety and depression. We prayed for her this week. She says, I, I, God hasn't healed me. But I think the things that he's telling me is to keep asking him to keep asking him, to keep believing, to keep asking him. I love what we see about Paul in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 where, where Paul says he has this thorn in his flesh. And we're not exactly sure what that is, what is going on there, but it's this, this pain, this, this, this illness, this tormenting thing that, that lives with Paul, that lives in Paul. And Paul says, I, I prayed earnestly three times. I, I asked God, would you take this away from me? And, and, and Jesus replies to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul, he writes this. For all Christians to read, to have access to for the rest of time, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, 
Therefore, I will, I will boast in my weaknesses. For it is in my weaknesses where Christ is strong. I want us to believe that Jesus is healer. And if God doesn't heal you, that you would boast in your weakness. That you would not grow tired of asking. That you would ask God to heal and you would ask God to heal and you would ask God to show you what and why. And God may not answer the side of heaven. But may we not grow weary. Jesus is healer. Keep asking. We're going to take communion here in just a minute. And, and if you come here tonight and if you're sick, if you feel like the enemy is just having his way with you, if you feel like that, that, that impure spirits have just been tormenting you and pestering you, can we lay hands on you and just pray for you? I'm going to invite you to to, to publicly take a step, to, to publicly demonstrate your faith. And, and here's me going first. And so this morning, I was at the office, and, and, and before I, I, was, I was about ready to leave, I was kind of looking in my desk. And, and in my desk, I have my toothbrush because I love brushing my teeth. And I have all these books. And, and then I saw this, this little um, jar of olive oil. There's nothing special about this olive oil. It's cooking olive oil. But I was thinking this morning as I was, I was, I was coming to, to preach the, the words from James chapter 5, James tells us, if any one of you is sick, call the elders from the church and anoint them with oil. The prayer offering of faith will make the sick person well. And we don't have elders in our church yet. We're working on it. But this is my way of, of showing you, like this is my way of looking foolish to you that I believe Jesus wants to heal. And if you're sick, if you're being tormented by the impure spirits, would you, would you come and let us pray for you? There'll be some men and women that have to respond. Man, we'll just lay our hands on you. There's nothing weird. That's, we're just gonna ask God to heal you. For those of you who are Christians tonight, as, as we take communion, if you don't believe that, that Jesus still heals, I want to encourage you to think about why you don't believe that. Does it make sense that Jesus has left all the healing to modern medicine and to physicians? Or perhaps does he have something that he wants to teach us, to show us about who he is and what he wants to do in America, in Nashville, in Ethos? As we take communion, if you come here tonight and you're not a follower of Jesus, If you come here tonight and you're not a follower, but man, you, you want to believe, I encourage you to ask someone that you came with, or if you, don't, if you didn't come with anyone, come up front and just ask us to, to pray for you that, that God would help you to believe. And for the rest of us, as we take communion, let's keep asking God this week, and this month, and this year, and for the rest of our lives, let's keep asking God to heal and to move through his son, Jesus. So I'm gonna pray for us. And I'm gonna give us a, a few seconds in, in the time of prayer. And I wanna just invite us to, to pray out loud together. That it can't just be me, that it can't just be two of us, that, that this is a, a thing that I think God is wanting our church to step into for us to be a people, a church, that asks God to move in this way. So I'm going to give us a little break in the praying, and I invite you, if, if you believe, if you want to believe, would you pray out loud and ask God, God, would you, would you stretch out your hand to heal and to move? So let's pray. God, I thank you for your good and real and powerful spirit that sanctifies us, that encourages us, that convicts us, that teaches us. And I know that right now, for my brothers and sisters, that you are doing all those things. God, I pray that the enemy, that he will not lead the things that you're showing us, the things that you're convicting about us. Don't lead us to condemnation. But that you would lead us to faith, to repentance, to action. 
And so God, I, I ask that, that you would move, that you would heal, that you would do through your servant Jesus what you did in Acts chapter five. And tonight in our body, as we're gathered here tonight, would you heal and move? So I open it up for those of you, my brothers and sisters who are here with me tonight. Let's, let's pray out loud. Let's invite God to, to move. If we want God to heal, and let's invite him. So let's pray out loud. God, we are your people. We love you. We know that we are nothing without you, God, that we are just ordinary people, but we live and we serve uh, an, an extraordinary God. And so, Father, would you be so pleased to heal and to move among us tonight? As we lay hands on sick people, would you bring healing? As we lay hands on people that, that have spirits that have been tormenting them, would you bring deliverance? And would you give us courage to walk, to not care what people think, to demonstrate our faith. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.